Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to be talking about liquid democracy. We have David Ernst, Cy Ray joining us on the show. Hello guys. Great to be uh, here. Thanks so much for coming on, really appreciate it. I'm thanks super, so super excited for this episode. For those that don't know, David Ernst and Cy Ray are building liquid democracy, which is a 21st century rethinking of democratic representation. And you can find the links in the bio below, liquid.us, as well as their YouTube channel, liquidfuture.org, as well as David's page, liquiddavid.com, the candidates page, liquidcandidates.com, and their Twitter profile as well. Guys, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Yeah. Overall, there's a lot to be optimistic about, and there are some things that are pretty concerning. Um, there's amazing breakthroughs happening all the time, but at the same time, there's tension happening, there's turmoil all around the world, people are losing faith in governments and leaders and representation, and as long as we have open and honest conversations, I think there's, there's a lot of hope to get things in a really positive direction, but um, current status quo trends leave a lot of people somewhat concerned. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, um, there are definitely a lot of reasons to be concerned about the future of the world and politics and democracy and everything else. And I think for a lot of good reasons, people often feel frustrated about the direction that our institutions are going in. But um, there are de it's important to keep in mind that are, you know, not just us, but lots of people around the world who are looking to explore innovative and creative solutions to solving lots of the big problems that our generation's facing. And so overall, I'm optimistic about the future. Yeah. And then what within your journeys led you guys to be so interested with liquid democracy? Can I go first? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, actually, I've only been working on liquid democracy and with, with David on Liquid US for a few months. Uh, before that, I was actually living in South Korea, where I was a Korean government scholarship uh, research fellow, and my area of expertise was in North Korea. And North Korea is, uh, in name, a democratic country, but in practice, it's the exact opposite of that. Uh, it's a totalitarian, despotic, sort of authoritarian regime. People have no freedom of movement, no human rights, uh, no representation in their government. And so I think probably by studying a case that so starkly contrasts with the kind of system that we have in America and the kind of system that we want to improve upon and build out, uh, sort of real democracy, uh, made me really curious about ways that we could achieve that. Um, seeing a place in the world where democracy didn't exist made me realize how important it was. Um, and so I remember one time when I was just back in America on uh, vacation from school, uh, I was hanging out with David and he pitched me on this idea called liquid democracy and I found it to be really inspiring and powerful and that's what led me to where we are today. Yeah, yeah, just, just to speak about North Korea, I saw a headline, I think it was yesterday, that one of Kim Jong-un's top associates was just killed by firing squad because he, uh, the way a diplomatic summit with Trump went, they weren't happy with it and so they just executed him, mm. just like yesterday. Mm. So that is a reality in one part of the world, and hopefully we can move in the opposite extreme. Yeah. Um, to fill out my personal answer, did you want to add to that? No, go for it. To fill out my personal answer, um, I, I grew up around politics a lot. We talked about it around the dinner table all the time. I was always personally really frustrated by the partisanship, by the way it was like so tribal and so team-based, and it's like our team is, is flawless and the other team is um, evil, can never be trusted, corrupt, all these things. And both sides were saying this exact same story. So that was a little, um, there's some cognitive dissonance going on there. So I was always confused. And then um, I, I was doing a few projects to try to help uh, what I saw as helping the situation, especially in 2016, trying to uh, get people to understand what was happening. And one thing led to another, and we were realizing what is now possible with technology. And working with friends, we saw what other people were doing around the world, and that's when we were really deeply introduced to these ideas of liquid democracy. And the concept has been out there since like 2000 or so. It it's, goes back a while, but there wasn't always um, easy to use, reliable, free uh, interface technology to actually make it a reality. 
And that's something that my personal background that I've done a number of times. And so I saw an opportunity to help push the ball forward and push. And so just talking with, I just share this, this idea with friends, like with Sai and with other people. And when we go into depth with it, when they'd have an open conversation, they'd be like, oh my God, mm -hmm. that's incredible. You have to, please do this. You have to work on this. Um, that sounds amazing. So it, the enthusiasm was just so contagious. And this is what I've been doing for about three years now. OK, so first is this example of a dichotomy between a place in the world that has absolutely no uh, freedom, uh, no human rights, um, no representation in their governance versus uh, uh, ones that do. And so to at least have the gratitude to realize that, wow, OK, at least we have this. Mm -hmm. And then there's still a lot to improve on, but at least we have this. And how do we help um, make it so that other humans in the world can have human rights. Mm. Um, okay, and then then we also have this, the, 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 the partisanship that we see today, the tribalism that we see today, the biases and dissonances that we see today need to be, we need to be, be mended. That the nuance needs to be explored. The love and compassion towards each other needs to be explored um, better to figure out how to best move forward. And then we have new technologies in place as well that are enabling things like virtual citizens, blockchain technologies, taking a stance in politics as well, decentralized ledgers, um, also not being able to just remove people off the face of the earth for their land and their money, these types of things. So we have a lot of interesting things that are sort of brewing in this pot of like the future of democracy, which is super exciting. And you guys will be explaining to us kind of like on a liquid side of things, um, how to be able to, um, how to actually have your own representation. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. I wanna ha um, hit on something on the way is, um, let's do a little um, lesson on, on, on history as well. So, um, so post-independence, um, post-1776, um, we explored um, what was our, 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 uh, our constitution and our own Bill of Rights, and our own way of having a three-branch style of governance. And we've had that sense with amendments. We've had that sense 240 years. So to think that with the exponential technology agent, a population that's hockey stick, that we should keep things the same is ludicrous. We need to update. And so would you speak on part of the history and, um, and where we see some of the most pressing updates? Totally. Yeah, I mean, and, and even going back before 1776, the vast majority of humans that have ever been alive, at least since the agricultural revolution for the last 10,000 years, have lived under a warlord, have lived over in some sort of absolutist system with one, with one ruler. So even the idea of democracy, I mean, you're talking about going back 200 years, it's, it's kind of an anomaly on, in human history. And self-governance, when they talked about, when the American founders talked about the American idea, it was seen as this like experiment in self-governance. And it was moving away from the monarchy of the British system. And of course, the British system was a constitutional monarchy, so they did have their parliament with the House of Lords and House of Commons. But, but really, democracy is a relatively new idea. And most of the countries, I think by number, less than half of the countries in the world even today claim to be democracies. Can't remember the exact I number think there. It's, it's been about 20 years since we hit the 50% mark, yeah. but that's still not very, we, we have a long way, way to go, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's questionable, you know, how many of those are real democracies where people ha feel like they're actually being representative, yeah. and how many of those are just kind of nominal. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. So then, exactly like you're talking about, the, the world has changed in so many ways. I mean, to imagine that we would use the transportation technology of 1776, yeah. that's a horse. And, and the actual communication infrastructure at the time was you write a letter with a quill, you give it to a person on a horse, and they ride for a week to get your message from New York City to Philadelphia. I mean, it's a, and that's one direction. Versus today, you know, we can send a text message instantly. We can stream a video all around the world nearly instantly. So, so much of our world has changed, and we see that in just about every industry except the way that we collectively address the problems that we face as a country, as states, as regions, as cities. For the most part, it's really still uh, based on these ideas from the 18th century.
which exactly like you say is something to be grateful for. I mean, without a doubt, it's, uh, it's got us a long way, it's built the roads, police, firefighters, there's a lot to be proud of there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's so many signs and so many measurable things that you can point to where people are not satisfied and not happy. And it, there's a certain trend where it sort of seems like, someone used the phrase, a friend said, it seems like democracy is bursting at the seams right now. Mm. And so it's concerning just because um, there are trend, this has happened before. We've seen cases, there are, uh, IMF has done lots of studies of what happens in places where people no longer have faith in democracy. And um, it very quickly turns into hell on earth. I mean, it's just, it's just society's collapse and it, it just gets really ugly. And so um, I'm of the opinion, and I think a lot of people are of the opinion, that we ought to be able to do a, a lot better given what our modern uh, tools are available to us and, and so many other things. Any thoughts from your side for move on? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly, um, you know, as David said, there's a lot of things to like about the way our founding fathers, you know, set things up in the 18th century. Um, separation of powers, I think, is really, really important. I like the fact that the administrative, judicial, judiciary, and legislative branches can, can place checks on each other and make sure none of them are, you know, abusing their power or stepping out of line. At the same time, there are a lot of thing, there are a lot of ways in which the world has changed that I think our founding fathers you know, definitely couldn't have anticipated. And so in order to tackle some of these modern challenges, we have to be innovating and thinking about creative solutions, ways to do that. Um, you know, traditionally the government is not known as being the, like this really quickly evolving, very adaptable, uh, rapidly sort of advancing institution. It's very slow and bureaucratic, and that's challenging. Um, and the really cool thing about liquid democracy, and maybe we'll get to this a little bit later, is that it really, uh, helps solve a lot of the biggest problems that our political um, you know, environment is facing today. Corruption, gerrymandering, lob lobbying, you know, this sort of crisis of underrepresentation. Uh, Liquid offers really, really useful solutions to those problems. And so that's why you know, we're working on what we're, what we're working on. Yeah. I'm so excited to unpack them. Let's, let's do um, some of the, on the, some of the, um, um, the slides, the, the images that we have. Um, the very first one um, is a congressional job approval ratings from 2002 to 2019. Do you approve of the way Congress is handling its job? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a very simple metric that you can point to that just suggests that people are not happy with our government right now. And it's just this is based on Gallup polling every year, multiple times a year. They just ask a random sample of citizens yay, nay, do you approve of the job Congress is doing? So it's actually at a high point just after September 11th, and it's just been on a downward trend for nearly 20 years now. It's hovered really around like the 20% mark, if not at some points down as low as 10%. So like nine out of 10 people for large amounts of time have said we don't approve of Congress, of our representation in the government. Yeah. And that's, um, definitely worth being aware of. Yes, I mean, yes. it's, it's a concerning trend. And then the it's next... It's this way for a long time. I mean, this isn't yeah. one year, two years. This goes back decades. Yeah, yeah. And to be hovering around like a 20% mark is, yeah, it's egregious. There's there yeah. updates have to get deployed. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the next one, Ronnie? This one, you found this one. This one <laughs> surprised me because it's, it's really stark. Um, this is just gets into specific criticisms that people make of politicians. And so it's um, percentage of Americans who say most elected officials lose touch with people quickly, don't care what people like me think, put their own interests before the country's interests, are corrupt, or just simply can't be trusted. And every single one of these metrics is over three quarters. Yeah, this can't yeah. be trusted one, it's almost nine out of 10. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not to, not to indict the individual people. The way I read this more than anything else is the system itself is creating these really perverse incentives yes. where um, we're just left with, with leadership that we don't believe in. And that's, I mean, who, who wants to live in that? And one of the aspects of this that I think is 
now bursting at the seams, as you said earlier, is that the amount of our family values from the kin tribes that we used to live in just did not scale. Mm -hmm. And so then all of the self-dealing, I'm now telling you a story to sell you shit that you don't need instead of telling you a story for mm -hmm. your fitness inclusive fitness levels. Yeah. And so that's why we have the politicians are self-dealing rather than actually representing on like an inclusive stakeholding um, methodology. And I really do think that some technologies like blockchain could really help with things like that. Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. That's a, that's a really fascinating lens to look at it through. So there's um, one, we don't have a graph up on here, but one way to think about this is just the number of representatives and the number of people that they're representing and just think of that as a ratio of yeah. how many constituents per representative. And so right now there's 500 members of Congress if we're looking nationally, and there's 300 million Americans. And so it's about a million to one, give or take. It's 700 something odd thousand yeah. to one. Yeah. And that number is, it's absurd when you think about it. One person is supposed to represent the, the interests and the political beliefs of 700,000 people. And what was it when we first started? Exactly, yeah. that's exactly the point. Is, is it wasn't designed to be like this. This was actually, so to your, the short answer to your question is 30,000. It was 30,000 when yeah. we first started. It was 30,000 yeah. to one. And this was actually meant to be the very first amendment to the constitution. Mm -hmm. Before freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and freedom of the press, they, the original Congress, the very first Congress in 1789, passed what's called the Congressional Apportionment mm. Amendment. It's like this little story that most people have never heard where they want to write into the Constitution, we'll add a new member of Congress every time it gets above originally 30,000. And then once they got past 200, it was going to raise to 40,000 per representative. And once it got past 300, it's gonna raise up 50,000 per representative. So what it would mean is that today we'd have like 8,000 members of Congress. Yeah. And you just have a much closer relationship with your representative. You just know them a lot better. You know them a lot better. Yeah. And then there's less self-dealing. So if exactly. we would have scaled Congress to 8,000 members, maybe it would be harder to potentially Completely. pass some of the legislature like, yeah, that we want. But at the same time, there would be less self-dealing, um, more inclusive fitness, yeah. Right. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I mean, the 1 to 30,000 ratio, to me, it's better than what we have now, but it still doesn't sound very good. I mean, like you said, <laughs> um, I mean, I would love, I mean, so one of the things we do a lot when we talk to people about this idea of liquid democracy is we just ask them a simple question, which is, do you know who your you know, local, state, and national representatives are? And so just a few days ago, we did this event, this really cool political kind of bar cafe space called Manny's. And David was a panelist uh, you know, running an ev event about the future of democracy. And he asked people in the audience this question of, do you know who is representing you in government? And Very I, politically engaged people. Right, so w what percentage would you say of the audience um, knew the answer to that question? Maybe one in five. Right, so this is a problem. Um, from my perspective, um, let's talk about that. Who, yeah. who in San Francisco is representing us right now? So on the city level, there's a board of supervisors. It's 11 supervisors. Each yes. one represents a different district. So where we are right now, I think we're in district six in Unsoma. So that's Jane Kim. Jane Kim, okay. Yeah, yeah. and then and London Breed. Yeah, yeah, the mayor. The mayor, yep. Yeah. And then Gavin Newsom of the entire state. Yep. Okay. And then yeah. we have senators and representatives yeah. also of the state. Yeah. Two senators, 50 representatives? Is it that high? Yeah, I don't know for the whole state. Pelosi yeah. is the one for all of San Francisco. Pelosi yeah. is for a million people. Right. Seven hundred eleven thousand. Right. So one she really, person. Yeah. 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 I mean, the senators are even more because there's twenty-five million registered Californians. So that's twelve million. Yeah. For one senator. Yeah. Yeah, Kamala Harris and Feinstein. And so and so. But th there's an argument to be made that they represent the state, not the individual people. That's, I mean, that's officially what it is because every state they get two, no matter the number of people in the state. Wow. Yeah, it's, wow. it's a crazy job. And so imagine being that person and trying mm. to hear from all your constituents every day. Mm. No, it's impossible. It's of impossible. Course. You won't yeah, have time like to breathe, raise a family, <laughs> be in nature, none of that stuff. No, of course no. not. Yeah. yeah. So there does need to be a better way. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I mean, I was just going to add on to that. Um, I love this idea of kind of the family or the tribal unit. 
And I think our politicians in a perfect world ought to be, you know, we ought to trust them as much as we can trust our parents or our siblings or our best friends. Yeah. But right now, it feels like we're so disconnected from them. It's like, you know, first of all, how can one person ever represent a million people? It's just logically impossible. And it's just weird that I'm represented by this person that I don't really know, I've never met, I don't know that much about them, and they don't know that much about me. Yes. Um, and, and so- And you didn't choose them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so Even if things, you don't vote for them, they're still, you're still stuck with them. Uh, things have to change. And, and just another thing that I was thinking about as you guys were chatting is, um, I remember hearing the statistic that, that peop members of Congress spend something like 70% of their time lobbying you know, donors trying to get money for, the, for their campaigns for re-election. Yeah, and yeah. if they're spending that much time hang, you know, hanging out with rich people trying to get money, how much time are they really spending engaging with the population as a whole or thinking about the best ways to vote on legislation or actually doing their job? So yep. we have a lot of problems. Um, yeah. Damn. Yeah. When, <laughs> we also didn't plan for that to happen where 70% of the time of the people that represent us is spent like, campaign Fundraising. financing. Yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. such a corrupt system. really. Well, yeah. but you have to do it. I mean, if you don't fundraise, yeah, yeah. then you lose. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. very simple. And so it's not, again, it's, it's not even that these people are devils. It's that the system itself has created these rules yes. that yes. You can't compete any other way. Mm. As, as, as is now like to be said, our founding fathers are rolling in the graves, <laughs> <laughs> wondering why we haven't deployed updates to, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's that quote from Jefferson, like, we should renew the Constitution every generation. Mm. Every generation, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right a great it. quote, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, that, yeah, and deploy the right updates, yeah, yeah it's just, it, it makes sense, yeah. It's a very interesting idea. I'm not sure if I would want to go that far because I think there are a lot of really important and meaningful, valuable ideas in the Constitution, totally. like freedom of speech. Totally. Um, and so that's, but I think a lot of the issues that we're facing really have to do specifically with our legislature and underrepresentation yes, in this democratic yes. process. And yes. so, you know, I still want a constitution. I still want a, you know, a president and a judiciary, but I'm just really trying to tackle a lot of the problems surrounding, for example, Congress or, or local yes. representatives. Yes, yes. Well. Okay, so let's go to the third asset, Ron. Okay, so three versions of democracy. Walk us through this. Okay, so direct democracy, a lot of, when a lot of people think about what we have now, they refer to it as representative democracy. I think that's a misnomer. I would call it electoral democracy because it's based on elections. Mm -hmm. So that's what we see right now. We pick these members of Congress or city council members. There are representatives, there are elected representatives and they vote on issues for us. And ancient Athens, direct democracy 1.0, was mm -hmm. us voting directly on the issues ourselves. Exactly, so when people talk about the birth of democracy, they wanna to point to the Athenian forum going back 2,000 years ago, and that's 500 people gathering in a space together, voting directly on, should we do this with our shared treasury? Should we go to war here? Should we make this law? And it's, there's no representatives, it's you're voting directly. And you still see that today with referendums, ballot initiatives. Um, we do sometimes still take direct votes. But a lot of people think of our governance options as these, this balancing act between representative through these elected leaders and direct, where you're voting on citizen initiatives and ballot initiatives. And that's, um, those are two extremes and now we can do better, and that's what, what liquid democracy is all mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. And so- It combines. Exactly, okay. it gives you all of the options. And so mm -hmm. ju just to speak to that very quickly, so there mm -hmm. are a lot of people, there's the polling on it, something like 50% of the population or something say they wanna see more direct democracy in the US. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a very high number, surprisingly yeah. high number. And um, Elon Musk has said a bunch of times when he has his million person calling on Mars, he thinks it ought to be governed by all people having an app where they can vote directly on policy instead of having elected representatives. Yeah. Direct democracy for all million people. It only makes sense that if something gets drafted 
in the legislature and that rather than having somebody it, 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 we got to be educated on the like do we actually have the the capacity to read and understand what the actual law that we're voting on is or if we don't then can we do the the exactly. re representative i cast it exactly. to you because i trust that you know that you are going to read it and make a decision that on behalf of me exactly so, yeah, the idea of, of everyone weighing in on the policy makes a lot of sense when everyone's in the same room together. It's, it's the most authentic option you could have. It, it totally plays in this idea of consent of the governed. If we're going to make a law that this is illegal or we're going to spend our shared taxpayer dollars on this, it makes a lot of sense that we all would consent to it. But it just takes a lot of time. I mean, it would be crazy to imagine every single one of us was going to look through the 10,000 bills that were introduced in Congress last year. I mean, they took hundreds and hundreds of, of roll call votes. 10,000 just in one year. Last yeah, year. just last year there were 10,000 bills introduced and a few hundred, about 500 of them got brought to a roll call vote yeah. among all the members of Congress. And yeah. so we all live busy lives. I mean, we all have jobs, we all have families, we all have school and other responsibilities. And so it would be moving backward. The people that think that direct democracy, we just need more direct democracy, are missing the fact that that takes an enormous amount of time. And this stuff is really complicated. And you want to get it right. When you think about you know, Obamacare, one of the big piece, major pieces of legislation, arguably a large piece of legislation passed in the last decade, I mean, it was 1,000 pages. Yeah, yeah. And so expecting every last person to read a thousand page bill, it's just be informed on no it. way. No, of course not. And when you had back when you had so much time in the ancient Athenian times, that could be more easy to have the direct democracy. Well, those people were extremely wealthy. Mm. The people voting were all retired aristocrats. Mm. So this was their full time job. I mean, this was all they did. You know, just also just not yeah, selling uh, eight hours of their day every day for money. Um, also, just because then you could spend those eight hours engaging with your communities, figuring out what you wanted to do for the future kids, etc. <laughs> during those eight hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, yeah. So that's, that's what the situation has always looked like. Now, what we can talk about is the future solution, what liquid democracy offers. Sometimes it's also referred to as delegative democracy mm -hmm. because it's based on this idea of personal delegations. Instead of electing one representative for a million people, you get to actually pick your own representative. And the mechanism, very simply, is that each and every person can vote up or yay or nay on any item, any legislative item. And if you don't vote on it, then your personally chosen representative gets to vote on your behalf for you. Mm -hmm. So you get the best of both worlds. You mm. can always weigh in yourself when you want. Okay. And when you're not weighing in yourself, you still have your representative as a backup for you. OK, so there's something that I have to, to a timeline to place my vote on. And if I've placed my vote, OK, great, it's locked in. If I haven't, and then the final, then the person that I, let's say that Dave is the one that's casting, that's my delegate that I want to cast the vote, that if I haven't uh, cast it by that time, and uh, Dave has my vote gets added to the one that Dave would be casting. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you want to pull up the demo, this is yeah, a perfect time to perfect. show yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. Show it. Let's uh, do that. So, nice. So this is what the current system looks like with the electoral. We'll just skip right through this. But basically, the current system is we have this two classes. We have regular citizens around the outside here. And then we have a few politicians who are so, have so much more influence than everybody else. And mm -hmm. it's just it's it's this two class system. So now we're gonna switch to and the and it was the um, the the all of us on the outside yeah. and the person that's elected to represent us. So that's like the the one hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, exactly. all on the outside and one yeah. person on the inside. Exactly. Yeah, which mm -hmm. used to only be thirty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. which yeah. is still a crazy number. Crazy <laughs> number. Yeah, yeah. So this is what a liquid democratic system uh, can look like. So this is an example of people being able to weigh in on a single issue. So right now, just a few days ago, Congress is voting on should we give funding to areas that have been experiencing these disasters, like hurricanes. This is a big bill being fought in Congress right now. So assume that that's the example we're working with right now. So any one person, like Leah here, can say, yes, I'm in favor of that. Or they can say, no, I'm against that. And you can see the tally here changing. Mm -hmm. People in favor, people against. And someone else can vote. Exact same thing. But see, now we also have these arrows. What is this cluster that's happening? Yeah. 
It was already just preset up. This is just a sample. Okay. But the point is that exact, so these arrows show that delegation. Okay. So if this person here says, I'm in favor of it, all these people who have said ahead of time, hey, I trust Daisy, they're going to inherit, they're going to adopt and copy that exact same vote. Yeah. Okay. So this lets you see what a liquid democratic system actually uh, looks like in practice. Same thing. This, the reason they're in the center is because a lot of people trust that position. They're, they're elevating them, they're empowering them as a leader for our community. But then can Julian pass um, the vote from Julian? Like if, if five, one, two, three, four, five people have passed their vote to Julian for yay, but then Colton says no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's say Colton here, they're very influential. They're against the thing. But Ashley is like, wait, I actually am in favor of the thing. They can just override and take it back in real time, at any time. You always represent yourself. You can always weigh in yourself. Okay, so You're if, always in control. So, so if Ashley's passing uh, 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 the vote to Colton, that and Colton votes no, but everyone with Ashley was voting, okay, okay. Exactly. Oh, was delegating to Ashley, okay. Yeah, there's a, I, I, I gave a little bit of a misleading description. I, I always say that it's, if you're not voting, your vote is getting passed to the person, but a simpler way to think, or a, a more accurate way to think mm -hmm. about it is actually that Quinn here didn't vote, and so when Ashley voted, Quinn says, look up how Ashley voted and just copy the same position. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, it's the vote never actually left from Quinn. Quinn. It yeah, just copies just, the just position. Assume, yeah. I already said I like that person. I trust that Got person. It. For the most part, I agree with that person. However, they did it. I want to copy the same. That's way. great. So it's not like Ashley's getting forty thousand votes. It's uh, uh, in, yeah to play with. It's more that mm -hmm. um, Quinn's copying Ashley's one vote. Uh, exactly. And if, 30,000 people believe in the way that Ashley's voting, then the vote will be copied, okay. So you okay. always stay in control, you can always speak yourself, you can always, and if, you, and if you pick someone and you realize, wait a second, I actually don't trust this person, they made all these promises and then they didn't keep them, or you know, this happens all the time, of course, you can just change it in real time. Mm -hmm. Change in real time, and then can, uh, can Ashley, if I'm dedicating my vote to Ashley, can Ashley then uh, uh, pass the vote along to Colton? Yeah, yeah, so, um, only if Ashley is public is saying I publicly believe in Colton. Okay. So there's a separate so there's a separate question to be asked here about um, is your vote public or private? Okay. And so the way we've designed it with Liquid US and other people have different opinions about this, but the way we've designed it is you always can choose do you want to be public or private? Okay. Whenever you make a private vote, it doesn't get passed down to anybody. So you're just voting for yourself as one person. Okay. Whenever you make a public vote, then it gets passed down to everybody. And so that's your question, could you have multiple degrees, multiple levels, as long as it's public? Because everyone public. needs to be able to see what, you know, where the vote is coming from, who's being trusted here. Yeah, versus if it's private, then that's when corruption could exactly. occur of all sorts. It's just, it's hard to imagine that you could trust something if you don't know where it's coming where it's from. Where it's coming from. Exactly. Okay, so, and, and then I can um, choose to have this be on like a decentralized distributed ledger of, of public voting. Yeah, we're already yeah we're already doing that. It's kind of in beta testing right now, but we publish a ledger of all the votes, and it can be mirrored very easily. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see the complete history. And so just to just to yeah re get back to this again, the the point is that in what I believe to be a healthier democracy for the 21st century, you actually know your representative. These aren't these like far away ideas of these like politicians you heard about from the TV or from like a 30 second ad, or you know you have this very limited. They're almost like pitched to us like products. There's very limited exposure to them. Yeah, that's a pretty bad thing that they're pitched to us as like a product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's it's the best they can do because they have to convince a million people. It's the only way to get elected. Yeah. They have such a limited amount of time. In the future, though, instead of picking between candidate A and candidate B you'll actually be able to pick your friend, or your family member, or your professor, or someone you really admire, and you chose yourself. You don't need anyone else's permission. You get to be represented by the people you trust. Great, great. And then on a, on a, uh, on a final like, counts level, like how do we ensure that the, that, that the final says from in this liquid democracy style of voting are being uh, non-corrupted towards the final decisions on legislature 
What, what sort of corruption do you have specifically in mind? Uh, maybe like um, just making sure that when we're trying to say that, uh, like Ashley, who already has like a good amount of people that trust her, that, that the way that she's uh, voting in is not being corrupted. Like what is our she's security? Not bribed. Yeah, and what is our security that, that like, how, does, how is Ashley submitting that last mile to the, yeah, that, that's not being manipulated? Like, you know, is this happening computationally? How is this occurring? Yeah. Um, so, so we built a system called proof of vote. And so this gets into the, the ledger that we're talking about, the public ledger. And so basically any time a vote gets entered, so we, so we built the interface to take all the votes and it's open source and people can build other interfaces. We want these to be like democracy browsers sort of. Mm -hmm. But when you cast the vote, it gets entered into this official ledger of all the votes where you have the, the, the proof of all the votes. And so you, if it's public, you can just see your name in there. And if it's private, then um, we want to provide basically a vote ID. So it's a unique code like 68325 AD. And you get, a vo you get a receipt when you cast your vote. And so you can look up and see, there's my vote. And anyone can tabulate all the votes. So okay. it's, a, it's a transparent, this is in technical terms, this is referred to as end-to-end um, -end vote tabulation, vote verification. End to end vote tabulation. Verification. verification. Yeah. Because you yeah. you know I cast my vote and I can see my vote in the final in the count. Final count. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And right. um, there are ways that it can be even stronger in the future with like cryptographically signed messages. We're a little yes. ways away from that. Yes. In general our attitude is make something easy for people to start using and um, always be open and transparent about the ways in which we want to strengthen things technologically. So we, right now we don't have cryptographically signed votes, but we'd like to get to that in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you'd be able to say, um, you could be able to verify that your vote got entered correctly and sign that message. And we'd be able to say, okay, 90% of people have verified. Mm -hmm. And all that could happen automated as well. So yeah, it's a that's a fascinating subject. Yeah, that's that's heading us into the future as well. Um, let's hit on um, there were some of the some of the things that you guys actually passed as well. Um, so uh, AB fifteen oh five and uh, on, for local control and Senate Bill one twenty six for conflict of interest. Um, should we show the? the page where it showed kind of like how you guys put that together that that was pretty interesting for me when totally. you show me that yeah. yeah so this is all at charterlawreform.com charterlawreform.com okay, yeah great so what we've been talking about to date to up till now is the long-term vision for what 21st century democracy can look like thinking about you know 30 years from now what sort of democracy would be better for us to live in. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating conversation for people that are interested in this. The, the tricky part is, okay, that's, that's the long-term vision. How do we get from where we are today yeah. to there? So what we've been doing is we've been working with advocacy organizations on the ground right now who want to pass a specific piece of legislation. And so that's what this is an example of. So this is working with these group of retired teachers, educators, here in California, try to change the California state law around what are called charter schools. Charter schools are privately run schools that receive public funding, usually nonprofits. Some people confuse that, but uh, they're almost always nonprofits. And there are some cases where they work really well, but there are other cases where they don't work really well. And there's it's. A, we're talking about a huge amount of taxpayer money, you earn my money that goes to them, and sometimes um, they can end up harming a lot of other students, mm -hmm. kids, kids. So this group of teachers, they understood the current law, it's called um, the, the 1992 California Charter Law, Charter Act, Charter School Act, uh, down mm -hmm. here. Yep. And understanding the current law, they had very specific ideas about the ways we want to tweak the existing law to help solve this problem that the state is facing, the current educational system is facing. So they had these five leg particular legislative policy ideas, and one of them has already been passed, signed into law, signed by the governor. That was known as 
SB 126, Senate Bill 126, and that um, provides uh, legal restrictions around conflicts of interest. So apply to charter school board members the same prohibition of conflict of interest as applied to public school boards. Exactly. So the charter schools are typically nonprofits, but um, they're receiving a huge amount of taxpayer money here in my public funding. I'm hundreds of billions of dollars. If I'm on about. the charter school board and I also own the company that sells the desks, I exactly. Can't, yeah, I can't just buy exactly the desks for my Very own simple. personal company. Yeah, 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 yeah things like that. Non-controversial. Non-controversial. So, That's why it got passed so quickly. Non-controversial. Exactly. It just needed to be that code update. How do you get it as fast as possible? Well, if you go to charter charterlawreform.com, Law Reform. then you can easily endorse. Um, parts of this yourself um, and get people, the representatives, um, moving in the direction that you want. Exactly. Yeah. So 2,100 people have done that. So all across California, people have been weighing in and saying, yes, we need this. And they're even adding in personal comments and personal stories and so on and so forth. And every time someone uh, adds in, we automatically send their message along to their particular state reps. And yeah. we can verify, are these actual registered voters? Because on the internet, it's, there's a lot of fraud going on. So we've done a lot of work making it as easy as possible and also making it as trustworthy as possible. So we want to confirm that these are real people and get their messages to their specific legislators. And then um, let's... So this is, this is yeah, what we call ahead. a liquid initiative. This is a liquid and, initiative. Yeah, it's okay. an initiative that started on the Liquid US platform. And so there have been you know dozen different initiatives that we've been starting. and. We always want to work with an uh, existing group that, that knows um, here's the problem, here's what the legislative solution looks like. Yeah. And we can help set that up, and we're doing it in all different states and all different cities all across the country. Yeah, like you said, just more and more of these liquid initiatives, all different states yeah, across the country. That's fantastic. And then having people actually, like you said, every single time they endorse, make a comment, um, send that off, make the pushes happen. So that's right. Great. So right now, what, what people say is, um, you call your call your representative, call your member of Congress, call your your state representative, your state senator, and um, this is what people think is the best way to make an impact on policy, and it comes from a good place. The problem that I personally always have when I do it is that I call in, I usually hit a voicemail or something, or you know maybe. I get an answer and it's like, then what happens? It kind of goes in this black hole. Nobody ever hears anything from it. So what we are doing that's really distinct is that this, um, these citizen positions are totally public. I mean, people, when, when you call in, other people re recognize and can see X number of people are in favor of this and Y number of people are against it. And so what we're building towards is to actually create scorecards for every representative. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, right now, politicians will get these grades from representatives, like they'll get an A grade or an F grade from the NRA. We're working towards being able to offer liquid scorecards for every elected representative that very simply, instead of saying, does your voting record match what the NRA board wants, it's does your voting record match what your verified constituents, how they want you to vote. And so that's called liquid scorecards, and that's one of the benefits of weighing in this way, on top of it just being easier and more yeah. verified, yep. Liquid is we're trying cards. to create more accountability. Yeah, great way to create more accountability. And so you could actually look up and say, okay, for this representative, how good of a job are they doing actually listing their constituents on education issues versus science issues versus foreign policy issues versus so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even broken down by category as well. Let's, um, the, the, some of the next assets that we have, um, let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so this is um, s the selecting uh, pro proxy by issue area. So let's hit that one. I just wanna go to the yeah, we wanna hit the next asset. All right, there it is. You wanna explain this one? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, one of the things that really appeals to me about the idea of liquid democracy is that it's very uh, humble. Um, I think in a perfect world, all of our representatives would be experts on everything. They would know everything about science and economics and foreign policy. 
but that's just not the reality of how the world works. We all specialize in different things. Um, Albert Einstein was great at physics. I don't know how much he knew about healthcare. Nancy Pelosi has been working in government for decades and decades, and she knows a good amount about each issue, but it's hard to call her you know, a leading expert on all of them. You know, there's no perfect person out there. Mm -hmm. And so this, you know, we have within a liquid democratic system this idea of proxying, where if you don't have the time or the expertise to weigh in on a particular issue, you can delegate your vote to someone else. Someone else. But uh, another thing that can be layered on top of that is not just choosing one proxy for everything, but having an ish, you know, different proxies for different issues. Oh, yeah. And so you could choose, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson as your science delegate, meaning any time a bill comes up in front of Congress uh, that has to do with you know, a scientific topic like NASA, for example, uh, you could vote on, on it yourself, and if you don't, Neil deGrasse Tyson votes on it for you. And the same thing can be true you know, on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And so I think this is a really, really powerful idea because you know, not only do we want our representatives to be the people that we trust the most, we need them to be pretty smart because this stuff is really complicated. We want them to be experts. We want them to be really knowledgeable in their field. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act was something like 2,000 pages. I don't have time to read it, and even if I did, I don't know how well I would understand all the details of it yeah. because I don't have a background in healthcare law. My mom's a healthcare lawyer. She really knows that stuff. And not only that, but she has like dozens of friends who are, you know, who are even greater experts in that area than she is. And so I think this is the, the issue by issue proxying feature is one of the things that really attracted me to, to liquid democracy because it feels like we'll get such better, such more, such, you know, so much more informed outcomes than we're getting now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. By even proxy by issue area. Yeah. Too. So if I'm already well versed in a specific issue area, I can continuously mm -hmm. be voting my in my own stake there. But for ones that I don't understand, I'll just proxy off to the specific leaders in Absolutely. those fields. Absolutely. And it allows you to focus as well. You know, you're going to be really knowledgeable about some topics, but not about other ones. You can uh, do a better job on the ones that you are interested in because you know that the other ones are being taken care of by people you trust. Just like in our private and our private economy, you know, different people specialize in, as tailors, as carpenters making furniture, as engineers making electronics. It'd be crazy to imagine every last person had to do every last thing themselves. Yeah. And so, government is the tool we solve collective problems. Different people are going to have different areas of interest and areas of expertise to how we deal with different collective problems we face. Yeah, well said. Yeah. And then on the on the future. Um, we have the next asset. Um, yeah, that's so. The, yeah, so this gets into a different idea of the of how we make liquid democracy reality. So we talked a second ago about um, the liquid scorecards. There's this other idea, and this is this is really the thing that captured my imagination early on. Was okay. So we're talking about delegative democracy. What better democracy could look like? The the intuitive response is. Good, you know, you're gonna pass a constitutional amendment. Good luck. Mm. You know, no chance for obvious reasons. That that's right. But the difference is the idea is running these new people for office and working with existing people in office who say, I want to test this out just for this one single seat, just for this one single elected position. And so, rather than trying to pursue a constitutional amendment, I'm just gonna run for this office, and you can vote a liquid representative system in just for this one position. And so that's what this liquid candidate is. So this is a mock-up, a little two-frame comic of the Speaker of the House, kind of looks like Nancy Pelosi, asking uh, different representatives, how do you vote? And this representative is the liquid candidate, so they pull out their phone, and right on their phone, this is intentionally provocative, they push an announce vote button, and they hold their phone up to the microphone, and their phone says, the people of District 5 vote yes. So all they are is this button pusher. They got elected simply to actually represent the, the will of their constituents. The person is superfluous. Yeah. And that's, this is an extreme, this is a caricature. In real life, they're going to be in the room. They have a huge role to play in, in debate, in, in debate. communicating okay. what's happening, okay. and so on and so okay. forth. But the, but the final of, vote is, yes, tallied electronically by the people, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is a liquid candidate. 
No, I was just going to say, so, so David could talk more about this because he, he actually ran for office, but each liquid candidate can have their own sort of policy about how they're going to use feedback on the app to make decisions. And so some people can say, I'm always going to vote exactly in accordance with, with what the app tells me 100% of the time. And then other people could say, you know, I'll use the app as a really useful feedback mechanism, but at the end of the day, I'm going to use my own judgment kind of to mm. make the final decision. And then other people can say, you know, if a certain threshold, a certain percentage of my constituency votes, mm. then I'll make the decision, like 3% or 5% or whatever, yeah, yeah. then I'll make the decision according with, with the app. But, you know, it's a, it's a flexible concept for sure, yeah. But it's really powerful because it gives us a way to implement liquid democracy in America today without having to change any laws or, or pass a yeah, yeah. Without even to ask the current people in power, hey, right. will you volunteer to give up your power? Mm. Instead, we just run for office. Yeah, yeah, as liquid mm. candidates. Yeah. And the, all yeah. the nuance that you just broke down. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's also much safer because there's, you know, this is a powerful idea, but it's a relatively new idea. And there's a lot of details that still need to be ironed out and things mm. that need to evolve. And so the benefit of doing it on this uh, seat by seat approach is that the issues that we will face are isolated just to that seat at a time rather than trying to say, okay, yesterday the whole system was one way, tomorrow we're going to change it all overnight. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's incredibly disruptive. That's not wise or, or smart or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and the next asset actually shows the, the digital democracy candidates. Hmm. Yeah. In yeah. So there have been nearly a dozen people who have run in past elections. So this goes back to 2014. Um, yeah, here I am. Uh, <laughs> who have run for a legislative position, somewhere in the US, some at the national level, some at the local level, some at the state level, um, of all different parties. So that's an interesting question. Are they running in the major parties? Are they running in a third party? Are they running as an independent? And then what the specifics of their pledge was, uh, control basically means they, they're promising that they will do every vote in 100% accordance. Whereas engaged, or you could use the word empowered, means um, they'll use it as advisory, but they're not necessarily committing 100%. Okay, so liquid controlled is the nuance where all of the liquid democracy that's voted, uh, the constituency, you vote in that exact direction. Yes. Yeah. Uh, engaged means that you'll consider what mm -hmm. that is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The requirement that we that we really like people. Oh, and direct controlled is when they directly control it. No. So the What's direct that? versus liquid part means are you accepting proxied votes? Is it is it just direct democracy? So the number of people, especially early on, oh. have said I'm going to run for office. I'm going to give everyone an app that tells me how to vote, and and it's just one person one vote. There's no proxying involved. Mm. Okay, got it. Yeah, so it's just direct democracy. And liquid includes the process. Liquid includes the product, yes. includes okay. representation. I think that's really important. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. it's really difficult for people. Totally. And the thing is that it's, it's hard to imagine someone that says they'll be direct. Um, usually someone that's into direct would also like to support liquid. They just don't have the technology to make it possible. So that's part of our what we see our role is making it free and easy and trustworthy. And so um, that ought to be more common. But we... Mm. But when we publish uh, the proof of votes, you can see on every vote whether it's a direct vote or a proxy vote. So again, like Sai was saying, every candidate and every elected official has their the right to say, I'm only going to accept direct votes if they want or, or proxy votes. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a good thing because it allows us to kind of A-B test a lot of different approaches to what, a, what do people respond to best. So a lot of people thought it was really important when I was running that I have like a break glass in case of emergency clause hmm. where if I would I'd be controlled by everything, but if for some reason, you know, the, imagine the worst possible vote you could think of, hmm. I would be able to um, oh, okay. go against it, okay. but then I'd have to stand immediately up for a recall vote. Sure, sure. So if I took the, the break glass, if I took the emergency vote my own way, then everyone in my district would then be asked, hey, do you agree with David's explanation for why I did this, or would you like him to resign? Damn, this is a lot of code. Like, yeah. you know, if you yeah. do this emergency break glass mm. uh, uh, function, then, then they get to vote <laughs> immediately on if they want to keep you or not. Like, that's good stuff. The, 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 this is how to use computer science for democracy, yeah. Mm. And that was specific to me. Other people might not want that. Yeah, then so you can make your own clauses, exactly. see which clauses are popular. Exactly. Yeah, people can pick them up, add them. Yeah, this is great stuff. 
So right now there have been you know twelve odd people or, or whatever this number. Yeah, it's been a, looks I, like I think one more since the, or. I'm not sure well, now there's right. Agatha. Right. So these are just the people that made it onto the ballot. There's a whole another slide of. There's a lot of people that have announced their intention to do it, but didn't make it onto the and ballot. If you have a certain number. That's the last slide, I think, right? Um, this, this is about article people talking about liquid democracy all around the world. Mm. So there have been paper, academic papers. This was a PhD thesis that really ironed out the original uh, mechanisms. Yeah. There have been essays. There have been things that went on the front page of Reddit with 40,000 upvotes. Mm. Um, other academic papers and all different newspapers around the world. So it's a it's a growing it's a growing area of interest. Yeah, my favorite one is the Google Votes. Um, yeah. They used, actually at Google's campus, they used a liquid democratic voting structure internally to make a lot of interesting decisions, you know, from trivial things like how should, what meal should we have in the cafeteria? So you could vote on what meals you wanted or you could proxy to someone, someone who else, yeah. taste as you, yeah. to things like how should we spend the charity budget? Oh, great. Uh, which is very, very, it was a very cool test, test case and actually there's Someone named uh, Sergey Pitterman, my cousin, who's working there right, right now, who is working on sort of building out that system further at Google. And so this kind of technology has a lot of interesting applications, not just for government, but also in, in private organizations or unions or political parties as well. So it's pretty versatile. Yeah. That's great, yeah. Yeah, because these are some of these companies of 100,000. Yeah, employees. they're like yeah, as yeah. big as governments, governments or, or bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's great. So yeah, liquid democracy apply to all. Yeah, corporations, yeah, yeah. countries. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's really just thinking what what does healthier democracy look like for the 21st century, for the information mm -hmm. age? What we have right now is industrial age democracy. What is information age democracy? What is the information age democracy? Yeah, the yeah. exponential technology, exactly. eight, 8 billion humans on the planet <laughs> democracy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, this has been very interesting, and I feel as though we're, you know, we're totally headed in this direction. Um, it's just like getting the short term that you guys are building to get you to get us to the long term where we mm. see it happening. It's, it's just the, it's the critical stepping stones that have to happen to get us there. And even just the conversation about liquid democracy, you know, having others share it with their friends, their families, coworkers, mm. people online. Totally. So critical. Like, whoa, liquid democracy. Totally. Liquid democracy 3.0. Look at yeah. the history where we're at now. This type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So most people are not aware of this. I mean, if you, especially if you walk down the street, nobody will have heard of the term. When you ask people in a room, you know, you'll, you'll typically get like 1% or something like that. But it is growing. I mean, I've had a firsthand exposure to it just over the last few years. More and more people are reaching out. People are doing this all over the world. So just yesterday, I had people starting a similar group in Romania reach out. Mm -hmm. There's groups in Canada and France and Germany and India and Australia and all over the world constantly reaching out. For liquid democracy in their yeah. areas. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. Wow. And That's the thing up. is, the thing is that there's a certain inevitability to it, though. There's a mathematical inevitability to it because if you think the the person that gets elected, they get elected by the majority, unless what their their voting record on every single issue already matches what the majority of people want, then no matter what, the liquid candidate must be making more people happier on more issues. Mm. It's just it's just mathematically, how could one person out of a million do a better job than the combined efforts of all those people. Yeah, yeah. The challenge, of course, is is um, awareness. Is do all the people know about it and see it as an option? And, and so, how simple, how frictionless is it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so that is really plays into the need for the liquid candidates. So every time a, a person runs for office, the press loves to write about that. So I got a bunch of press about me. Other people have written. So one of my friends ran for for a senate seat. He estimated that hundreds of thousands of new people learned about liquid democracy just because he ran, even though he didn't he didn't win. He didn't even make it on the ballot. And so the point is that And this um, was, was Nathan Altman. Yeah, Nathan, Nathan I was gonna say. Yeah. yeah. Nathan and, and I should mention he's um where's what state he's in Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of people have this assumption that oh, this is kind of like a San Francisco Silicon Valley tech thing. No one in Indiana would want to use this. But he had a lot of really positive feedback from people out there. And so liquid democracy is a nonpartisan idea. It's something that appeals to people both on the left or the right of the spectrum or people who don't know where they might fall on this sort of simple dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. It's just democracy that's, that's healthier for everyone. 
and picked up by India, Australia, Germany, France, all these other countries yeah, around the world. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, huge. Um, couple, couple quick questions um, on the way out that we like to ask our guests. Um, this has just been super, so just such a good episode. Um, <laughs> let's hit on uh, what do you guys think, where do you guys think we come from pre-birth and where do you guys think we go post-death? <laughs> you want to take this one? <laughs> Was not expecting that. You caught me by surprise. Wow. Where do we come from pre-birth? Uh, you go first. No, good try. Yeah, you the go. Earth. We come from the earth. Come from our parents? Yeah. Where do you think we go post-death? Uh, hopefully people will remember us and share stories about us. I'll let you know when I get there, if I can. Do you guys <laughs> I don't have any special insight into that. Do you guys think we're alone in the cosmos? Probably not, it's too big. It's are humans the only, what, are, is there other life on other planets besides Earth, is that the question? Take it where you'd like. Um, I mean, I don't think we're alone on Earth so as a starting place. There's lots and lots of life forms on Earth. And growing numbers sometimes, depending on how you look at it. I, I don't know, I hope so. I hope there's more life out there. I haven't, I don't know. Do you guys think we're in a simulation? I mind a SETI. What was the? SETI. Yeah, SETI. Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But the one where you would donate unused computing power. Yeah, the SETI. Yeah. yeah, the SETI yeah. at home yeah. project. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Do you guys think we're in a simulation? Uh, I think it's an unfalsifiable question. I don't know how you, what, what's the, how do you measure, how do you deny it, whether we are or aren't? If, okay, let's say we're in a simulation, then what created the simulation? Is there is the simulation within a simulation? I don't know. I don't find it a. I don't know where to go with the answer, whether we are or we aren't. If we can get, if we can escape out of it, that would be really interesting. <laughs> but I don't spend a ton of time thinking about it. Sorry. I love video games. I would love to see technology progress to the point where we could create trillions and trillions of world that are worlds that are as or more complex than the world that we currently exist in. Yeah. We haven't got there, and so until we get to that point, I remain skeptical about the idea that we live in a simulation. But uh, it's a powerful argument. It's definitely something I'm, I think about from time to time. As a gamer, you yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> All right, and then last question. What do you guys think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The ocean. Stole my answer. <laughs> I spent a, a lot sunset of over Ocean Beach. Mm, can I combine both of them? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I grew up in Half Moon Bay for most of my life, yeah. so just near San Francisco, which yeah. is a beach town. That's so I spent a lot of a lot of time out on the bluff, just enjoying the beautiful scenery. Yeah. yeah. Holy cow, what a great episode <laughs> on Liquid Democracy this has been, you guys. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Dave, thank you. So much fun as thank always. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that was so enriching. There's your work, your work is, you know, it's already available for people to dive deep into, which is great. Um, already being uh, queered from around the world and implemented into um, systems around the world is very exciting. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Check out the links also, liquid.us, the YouTube profile, David's profile, the candidate's profile, Twitter as well. Check out those links. Share more conversations with your friends, your coworkers, people online, your family about liquid democracy and about the future of the rethinking 21st century democratic representation. Huge shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you, Ronnie. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace.